great banana flavored chocolate. Now you can bring home the excitement of the jungle with the new Nestle Tarzan Fun Pack. Disney's 1999 animated classic Tarzan is a strange beast of a movie. Mostly just in the fact it's the only film by Disney Animation Studios they kind of don't entirely own, which is why merchandise for the film these days is near non-existent. Yet despite those legal issues, it was able to carve out a little franchise of its own during the 2000s. Spanning one of the most okay direct-to-DVD sequels, a confusing yet fascinating Broadway adaptation, a handful of video games and the subject of today's video, the 2001 animated series titled The Legend of Tarzan. Hi folks, welcome to the show. My name's The Gladden Gladiator and it's my mission to info dump about everything Disney animation on the internet. Oh boy do we have a fun one today. The Legend of Tarzan is quite possibly the weirdest spin-off show to ever come out of the House of Mouse. Yet despite that, of all the 90s and 2000s cash grabs, it's also the most faithful to its source material, for better or for worse. However, before we get into all that, we should first establish where exactly Tarzan sits within the Disney canon. Okay, you all know the story of the Disney Renaissance. Throughout the 70s and 80s, Disney feature animation was struggling to adjust following the death of Walt. But even then, they were still consistently turning out good movies that, while not blockbusters, made a modest amount of the box office. Then the Black Cauldron and its troubled production came along and brought the studio to the brink of closing. Then the Little Mermaid releases and saves the studio even though it was Oliver and Company. This led to an incredibly successful lineup of movies with the rescuers down under lodged somewhere in between. But after Lion King, Hubris started to take over, as the following movies, while not failures, did not reach anywhere near the heights of their predecessors, eventually snowballing into the death of hand-drawn animation, but that's a story for another day. However, once we reached the 2010s, something interesting started to happen. As these later movies from the Renaissance were suddenly amassing these huge cult followings to the point where Disney started to see them as profitable brands, with Hunchback of Notre Dame, Hercules, and even Mulan to a certain extent following this trend. Then there's Tarzan, the final movie of the Renaissance, unless you're one of those people that counts Fantasia 2000. It's me, I'm those people. Tarzan is a textbook case of what I lovingly refer to as popular underrated Disney movies, meaning a film by Disney whose popularity has pretty much remained the same since its release. Tarzan was a pretty good success when it came out, and as far as critic reviews go, they were mostly favourable. No one thought it was a cultural milestone or anything, but it's a perfectly enjoyable film and that's basically where it still stands today. Most people have seen it and like it, but it's one of the less iconic films from the studio. If Tarzan does get brought up in conversation, it will likely be for three reasons. The Phil Collins soundtrack, the Pitch Perfect voice cast, and for animation geeks like me, the huge advancements it made in the medium, with the creation of the Deep Canvas technology, which allowed the artists to sculpt a computer-generated background for the characters to interact with that would still look as though they were painted. So Disney, in all their infinite wisdom, decided the next logical step would be to produce a low-budget spin-off animated series that had almost no songs and replaced the entire voice cast. Then they accidentally made it the best Disney spin-off, a title it would proudly cling to until Tangled came along 16 years later. Airing from 2001 to 2003 on UPN? Okay. The Legend of Tarzan picks up shortly from where the movie left off, and mainly follows Tarzan, Jane, Professor Archimedes, Turk and Tantor as they deal with various problems in the jungle, whether they be poisoned rivers, wildlife disputes, or leopard people. Because that's what Disney's Tarzan was missing for affinity users. Now, most people's experience with this series starts and ends with the 2002 directed DVD movie Tarzan and Jane, to the point where I'm sure that there are many people out there who have seen the movie without ever knowing there was a TV show. I'll come back to that later, as despite the movie being released a year after the series had finished, its production did end up affecting the show in a pretty big way. The Legend of Tarzan originally aired from September 3rd, 2001 to October 11th, 2001, lasting a grand total of 42 days on the air, which 
isn't great. I mean, even Dave the Barbarian lasted longer than that. When the series came to an end, it had 36 episodes, a far cry from the typical 65 you'd expect from a Disney show around this time. So like Tarzan's parents, was it a premature death or did it end up being mercifully shot? Only one way to find out. Now the first thing you'll notice when you sit down and start watching the series is the interesting presentation of the characters, so why don't we start there? As mentioned previously, not a single actor from the main cast of the movie came back to reprise their role, which I'm fairly sure is a first for a Disney spin-off. This company takes maintaining the integrity of their characters deathly seriously. Which is why whenever they're going about turning a movie into a show, they'll try and get as many people from the voice cast back as possible. So when we get to The Legend of Tarzan, it's a little off-putting that not only did none of the original cast return, but some of these impressions aren't great. However, if you can get used to the voices sounding a bit, or in some cases, a lot different, you'll pretty much find everything we know and love about these characters has remained intact in the transition from the silver screen to the LCD screen. Tarzan in the movie was voiced by Tony Goldwyn, who gave him so much life and energy, whereas here he's portrayed by Michael T. West. And I'll be with Jane. Jane, uh, good morning, I'm going, uh, out. As for his actual character in the series, obviously we follow his journey the most and the writers have done a great job at continuing his story from the movie. The main focus of Tarzan is his struggles when it comes to adjusting into his new role of being the leader of the family following Kerchak's death. However, in his downtime he continues to learn about the human world and society, which is sometimes just as much if not more interesting. Another thing I really admire about Tarzan's characterization is they don't don't turn him into a brooding stoic hero, constantly showing his more playful side in between all the serious moments. Jane Porter was originally played by Minnie Driver, but in the series the role is taken on by Olivia Diabo, who while sounding very different from the character Driver gave life to, does evoke the same spirit while making the performance entirely her own, bringing this perpetual energy and enthusiasm to the role that makes Jane my favourite character in the series. One. Two. Oh, look, bananas! <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, there's more to life than just swinging around on vines and saving people all the time. Things like music, science, fine art. Her episodes place a large focus on her adjusting to her new life in the jungle, learning to embrace swinging from vines while also holding on to her proper British upbringing. But my favourite thing about Jane in this series is they turned her into this metal badass. She may not have the physical prowess of Tarzan, but never misses a chance to give someone a stern talking to, no matter who they may be. Though she does also get to throw a decent punch every now and then. Professor Archimedes Q. Porter in the movie was played by Nigel Hawthorne, which was one of his final film roles before his death in 2001. Here the role is picked up by Jeff Bennett, an incredibly prolific voice actor probably Probably best known for playing Johnny Bravo. Jane! Jane, do you realize what you're standing in? A gorilla's nest! But I dare say I can jerry rig this waffle iron! Oh, good heavens, forgot breakfast again. He's pretty much the same as he was in the movie, as in he never really does much of note, with his character often being used as either comic relief or a plot device. They very much play up his role as a scientist far beyond what the film gave us, as whenever he's on screen, there's an 80% chance he's building some kind of contraption or mixing volatile chemicals. Though we do get the rare moment of him being a good father-in-law to Tarzan, which is always really well done. Turk is now played by April Winchell as opposed to Rosie O'Donnell. And yeah, you can tell. What kind of primitive beasts are responsible for this mess? Look, I don't care about your contained deco, whatchamacallit. The performance on its own is fine. Some people find it annoying and I can see why, but to me, it's tolerable. Turk is the same loud, snarky and rough gorilla from the movie, and they never really do much to deviate from that or add on to it. Well, aside from a handful of incredibly minor things that I'll talk about in a bit, rounding out the main cast is Tantor, played here by Disney legend Jim Cummings, instead of Wayne Knight. The horror! <laughs> it's gruesome! Hide me! Ah! 
Ow! Hey! I know this is an emotional crisis point for you, but don't take it out on me! Tantor still proudly holds on to his title as the literal biggest germaphobe on the planet, who is constantly incapacitated by his own anxiety about everything that surrounds him. However, in the series, his primary role is as the professor's assistant, which turns out to be an incredibly fun and wholesome dynamic. Carla has unfortunately been downgraded to the status of minor reoccurring character as she only appears in a few episodes. Here she's voiced by Suzanne Blakesey instead of Glenn Close. I'm your mother. I know everything. Now where have you been? Every leader has to face challenges, Tarzan. Despite how minimal her role is in the episodes, whenever she does show up, she is still just as wise and loving as she was in the movie. Depending on the story, she will either be supporting Tarzan and helping him through his struggles, or teaching everyone a lesson about the balance of the jungle. The writers of this series understood each and every character they were taking from the movie, and you can really feel the effort to create a seamless continuation of their stories. Though maybe you're still a little bit sceptical about these claims and need a little more convincing. Well, I've gone through the series and picked out one episode for each character that I think shows them either at their best or gives you a good idea of how they're presented throughout the series. Episode 2, Tarzan and the Trading Post, introduces us to the character of Renard Dumont, a morally neutral French capitalist who is opening a trading post on the shore. And once he's made it clear he's not interested in the gorillas, Tarzan allows him to stay, only to learn the trading post was built on rhino herding grounds as the rhinos have now taken residence in gorilla territory. And they aren't open to diplomacy, meaning the gorillas will have to move on. Tarzan goes to see Dumont, who isn't at all sympathetic to his plight, but offers him some explosives to drive out the rhinos, thus leaving Tarzan with a moral crisis. He can either go against his conscience or lose his family. The next morning, Jane finds out Tarzan took the explosives. As everyone races to stop him, only to find out he was using the dynamite to create a new home for the rhinos, demonstrating how intelligent the ape man truly is whenever it comes to creative problem solving. There are, of course, many other examples of great Tarzan episodes, but a lot of them take place later in the series and thus require a lot more context in order to explain. For Jane, I chose Tarzan and the Lost City of Opar, the furry awakening episode I mentioned earlier. In this episode, the professor is abducted by anthropomorphic leopards, who bring him before their queen La as a potential mate. She is obviously displeased and orders him to be sacrificed. As the rest of the family goes after him, Jane starts to feel like a burden, having to be constantly rescued by Tarzan even though he doesn't mind. Once they arrive and save the professor, La introduces herself and quickly grows fond of Tarzan, but his heart only belongs to Jane. Jane feels somewhat threatened by La who preys on her insecurities about being a burden, causing Jane to eventually quit at trying to keep up with them. Then this happens. <laughs> Jane. So Jane's believed to be dead as Tarzan instantly puts together this was Lars' plan, and so she attempts to kill them all, leaving the very much alive Jane to have to step up and save the day on her own. Of course, quickly realising fighting won't work, she uses her intelligence to create a distraction, which allows everyone to get three so Tarzan can defeat the army and they can all escape. You're sure I'm not a burden then? Jane is the best. Sir, you are wonderfully stubborn. Tarzan and the Fountain is the episode I feel best explores the Professor. It introduces the character of Dr. Robin Doyle, one of the Professor's colleagues who he quickly becomes smitten with. She's here to study the Waziri people, a tribe of native Africans that live in the mountains who were previously introduced in the series' first and only two-parter, Tarzan and the Poisoned River. However, the Professor starts to worry he may be too old for Robin. That's when he hears of a Waziri tradition in which when someone reaches the age of 80, they they make a journey up a snowy mountain to drink from a hot spring that revitalizes them. The professor wants to go, but is told it's too dangerous to make the journey at this time of year. So he and Tantor set off up the mountain, where they encounter danger and peril at every turn, as the professor has to use quick thinking and science to save them, until they eventually find the hot spring. Soon as the professor takes a sip, he feels positively spry, which is when the others finally catch up with them. Just in time to be sealed inside a cave, 
during an avalanche, during which the Professor learns the fountain was merely a placebo as Tantor reminds him of all the amazing things he did over the past two days. So he once more uses his brain to save everyone by having them shot out of the geyser. As mentioned, Turk isn't really a character who often goes through any major development like the rest of the cast, but the closest we get to a full character study on her is probably Tarzan and the Race Against Time. The episode focuses on Turk being jealous of how much time Tarzan has been spending with Jane, while also having to deal with the fact Tarzan was bitten by a poisonous spider, which will kill him unless they are able to find the rare Mububu flower, which only grows at the top of a waterfall, forcing Jane and Turk to work together and eventually reach an understanding so they can save Tarzan. Outside of watching Tarzan slowly die to the point where he starts hallucinating and sees Clayton, there's not much of note about this episode. However, it somewhat touches upon this idea that Turk isn't able to handle accepting her loved one's mortality, as throughout the episode she's very much in denial about Tarzan's condition, quickly changing the subject whenever it comes up until it's impossible to ignore, which is something that comes up again. It's not too much, but it's the most depth that gets added to Turk's character during the show's run. Now the next episode I'll be discussing is Tarzan and the All-Seeing Elephant, which while not the best overall Tantor episode, I've got to talk about the episode of Disney's Tarzan that is all about faith and religion. Following two near-death experiences, Tantor starts believing in the All-Seeing Elephant, a legend from the savannah about a mystical being in the clouds who watches over and protects all elephants. As for the rest of the family, there's a mixture of beliefs. The professor is on the side of science, Turk is on the side of that stupid, Jane is skeptic, and Tarzan doesn't really know if he believes in the ASC, but he does believe in Tantor. The characters journey up a mountain in order to learn the truth, as Tantor now believes he has a magical safety net. So he starts throwing himself into various deadly situations and is simultaneously saved by some sort of coincidence. Following almost being crushed by a rock slide but coming out unscathed, Turk temporarily turns to the all-seeing elephant, pushing Tantor forward only to realise that she has now set Tantor up to have his hopes be dashed. Jane and the others come up with a plan to save Tantor's spirit and this is quite possibly my favourite Tantor moment in the entire series. I was thinking, um, maybe you don't have to watch over me anymore. Oh, uh, really, Tantor? It's not that I don't appreciate it. It's just that, you know, if you didn't watch over me, you'd have time to watch over my friends. Like my best pal, Turk. Tantor is scared of everything. Yet, when he suddenly believes a higher being is protecting him, it makes him so much more bolder and confident. Yet, the first chance he gets, he willingly wants to give it up in order to keep his friends safe. However, Jane's ruse quickly unravels, leaving Tantor feeling dejected. On the way back down the mountain, the rest of the family become trapped on a crumbling ledge, with Tantor trying desperately to knock down a tree and give them a bridge across, despite how much pain it's causing him. Then suddenly, a bolt of lightning strikes the tree, knocking it over and allowing everyone safe passage. That's when they look into the sky and see... Well, be... Yeah. While I wish the episode had kept it more ambiguous as to whether or not the all-seeing elephant is real, and instead just settled on the idea people can believe whatever they want, as long as it makes them happy, and doesn't directly hurt anyone else. But I still greatly enjoy Tantor's story here, as we get some of his timidness at the very beginning, then see him develop a newfound confidence before it all culminates in a very heartwarming moment. And the episode as a whole starts an interesting discussion about faith, which I think is all it was really trying to do. Tarzan and the Lost Cub is the best Carla episode because it's one of the rare times she's a somewhat major player in the story. In the episode, Jane finds a lost leopard cub and can't bear the thought of leaving him alone. I know the feeling. I once found someone who was all alone. While everyone quickly gets on board, Tarzan is resistant for obvious reasons, leading Jane to remind him he was once in the same situation. But after a while, it becomes clear this isn't working. Jane, unsure of what to do, turns to Carla for guidance, who tells her if there had been other humans around when she found Tarzan, she would have taken him to them. So in spite of the obvious danger that was brought up in the beginning of the episode, that's what the pair decide to do. They're quickly attacked by the leopards, but then saved by the cavalry arriving. While they fight, the leopard cub 
goes to get its mother, who then wards off the others and allows the family to escape. They make some new friends, and Tarzan is forced to confront his own personal biases. While Carla only appears at the beginning and end of this episode, the scenes we do get of her are incredibly strong and call back to why she is one of the most underrated characters in the entire Disney canon. There's also a slew of original characters made just for the series, but we'll address those as they come up later. So now that we've fully established how well the writers handled the characters in the transition from film to television, it only makes sense to take a look at the animation next, which I imagine will be the most contentious aspect of the show for a lot of people, as admittedly, it is a mixed bag. Nevertheless, there is still genuine effort put into the visuals of this series that I feel warrants some appreciation. It's just sometimes you have to squint in order to see it. Now, from the footage you've been seeing, you've likely noticed a wide variety in terms of the animation quality. Some episodes have incredibly fluid and slightly more on-model character animation, and others don't. Now, this is not new information to animation aficionados. It's been common practice for decades now to have multiple animation studios work on the same show to speed up production and cut costs. But this is the legend of Tarzan, so it has to take things to the next level. So Disney had not one, not two, not even four, but ten animation studios who worked on the series, allegedly, as two of them were apparently uncredited. And once you realise that, all of this starts making a lot more sense. Why the show has these fast-paced, well-choreographed and intense fight scenes while also rarely ever seeming to be able to draw the characters on model. Then there's the quite frankly bizarre and off-putting colour palette that makes the show look simultaneously overly vibrant and quite dull. I mean, what was the thought process with Jane's skin tone here? How, after months of living in Africa, has she gotten paler? To end this section on a more positive note, I will say when the show is put in the right hands, it can be visually stunning, even somewhat pushing the envelope for TV quality animation. But now that we've gotten a good grasp on the basics of the series and how it handles its identity as a spin-off, we can finally get into the nitty gritty and talk about just what makes this show tick, as well as why, to me, it really stands out both compared to its predecessors as well as what came after it. There are many factors that, in my opinion, make this show a cut above the rest. Depending on your initial thought when you think of a TV series based on Disney's Tarzan, the tone of the show is either nothing like you were expecting, or exactly what you anticipated, yet still quite surprising. As I keep reiterating, this series was the first time I felt a Disney spin-off tried to be a worthy continuation. While now, with the likes of Tangled and Big Hero 6, we're no stranger to a spin-off show attempting to tackle more complex subject matter or character over themes from the movie, back then this series was one of a kind, willing to experiment and not be afraid to explore much darker themes in its stories. Several episodes of the series do base themselves around exploring detailed and complex topics surrounding mortality, the environment and the nature of man. Now while this show was not alone in touching upon these things, it always handles them with a certain level of tact. Rarely does an episode feel too preachy or in your face about a certain message. This isn't some moral of the week, very special episode kind of show. Everything always ties directly into the characters and their emotional journeys, which makes everything feel so much more natural and meaningful. One of my favourite episodes is called Tarzan and the Outbreak, and is the most blatant save the rainforest sort of episode the show ever did. Though through some incredible storytelling, manages to avoid many of the pitfalls you often get with those kinds of episodes. It centres around a logging operation setting up in the jungle, led by Markham, a man trying to make a living so he can raise his daughter Abigail in the absence of his recently deceased wife. Him and Tarzan attempt to reach an agreement but it quickly falls through. And just as things seem to be heading to an all-out war, all of Markham's workers and Abigail fall deathly ill. As through tearing up the ground, they release some long dormant virus. Tarzan and Markham search through the jungle for everything the professor needs to make an antidote, only to learn the last ingredient is a flower that used to grow in the land Markham tore through. 
thus leaving him devastated. Thankfully though, early on in the episode, Abigail went flower picking, meaning the professor has enough to make a vaccine for everyone. The episode ends with the workers planting seeds to grow back the land, as Markham decides he is going to find a less destructive way to make a living. While obviously this episode is not perfect, I do greatly respect it for how it delivers an environmental message without it ever feeling too heavy handed. Because it conveys it through a very well told and human story that doesn't demonise anyone. By portraying Markham and his workers as actual people rather than some evil force that must be defeated, it allows the audience to be able to relate to them more, thus giving the moral a lot more impact because it's not some cartoonish supervillain causing mass destruction, it's human beings. Which is far more powerful than any other cartoon or movie with an environmental message that I can recall. Now before I oversell this, I will say not all the episodes are like that. Sometimes we get an intense clash of ideologies that questions the dichotomy between good and evil. Sometimes Tarzan meets the former president of the United States, Teddy Roosevelt. Yes this is real. When you'd tune into an episode of this show, you'd never know what you were going to get, but I'd say that's honestly half the fun of it. Will you get an episode where Jane introduces democracy to the jungle, or an episode where Turk gets stuck in a hole? Episodes of this show don't really follow any specific patterns, meaning every single one is a completely unique experience. Meaning by the end, it's still constantly surprising you, and no matter what, it never gets boring. Another aspect I feel in which the series is significantly ahead of its time is the attention to detail when it comes to continuity and world building, particularly when it comes to its small but really well developed reoccurring cast. I've already mentioned Dumont who runs the trading post as well as the Waziri people who appear in several episodes across the series, but you also have characters like Hugo and Huff. Two gambling obsessed con men on the run from the French Legion after escaping prison. Their crime? Refusing to burn down a village of innocent civilians. At the end of their introductory episode, they are given permanent residence and jobs at the trading post. In this show, we get full blown story arcs and ongoing character development where you really see everyone evolve over the show's run. Going back to Renard Dumont, for his first few appearances, he is, as I stated, a very morally ambiguous character. He is neither friend nor foe to Tarzan and only acts within his own self-interest, which sometimes leads to him helping out the main cast. His initial character is that of a capitalist who only concerns himself with growing his business and wealth, yet over the course of the series you do see him start to change, seeing him do more selfless things that don't benefit him and in general becoming a much more pleasant and likeable character. This culminates towards the end of the series in the episode Tarzan and the Prison Break, which sees Hugo and Huff get found out by the French Legion and sent to Cape Doom. Tarzan goes after them only to end up as a prisoner himself. Meanwhile, Jane is attempting to contact the magistrate in the hope of getting this whole thing sorted out, but has no luck. In the end, Dumont uses some recent costumes he received to dress up as the magistrate and free them, both because he wanted to help Jane and he somewhat likes having Hugo and Huff around. When watching all of Dumont's appearances in order, you really do gradually see a significant change in his demeanour and attitude, becoming a person who, while still mostly interested in gaining wealth, does have some kind of heart. Now, many times before, you've heard me praise the romance between Rapunzel and Eugene, specifically for how their relationship was handled in Tangled the series. Often I've cited them as being the greatest Disney couple of all time. Well, while re-watching this series, I realised I may have to rethink that statement. Because while I wouldn't say they're better than New Dream, Tarzan and Jane do give them a decent run for their money. I've seen this series quite a few times in the past, but only when I started to think critically about it for this video did I realise just how well written Tarzan and Jane's marriage is. And you heard me right, marriage. The series follows Tarzan and Jane during the first few years of their lives as a married couple, which is something we don't get to see often from Disney, and they handle it exceptionally well throughout the entire run. I don't want to keep comparing them to Raps and Eugene, but very much like them, they have a strong health healthy relationship with constant and open communication that shows just how much they bring out the best in each other. Both these two are entirely devoted to one another. There is never any needless drama for the sake of tension. In fact, there are so many clever subversions of that very trope. 
there are multiple times in which other women throw themselves at Tarzan and he is completely oblivious to it purely because he will only ever love Jane. I tried to think of a single episode I could point to in order to demonstrate how well they handled this aspect of the show, but in the end I couldn't narrow it down because every single episode would have gotten the point across. So here's just a few of my favourite interactions between these two across the series. What's this word? Hmm? This word here. K-I-S-S? -S? Oh, you should know that one. K-I-S-S -S is kiss. And what does that mean again? <laughs> Let me see if I can offer a definition. Or better yet, a demonstration. You act more like an ape every day. Like an ape? Ah, uh, well, I never. I heard such a sweet sentiment. You could have had a legion of adoring fans, not to mention gorgeous leading ladies. I already have a gorgeous leading lady, and she's not fictional. Oh, this is all so wonderful. Us, here, together. There's no place I'd rather be. And those are pretty much all the major points covered when it comes to highlighting what really works about this series. Now, you're all probably thinking this sounds like an intelligently crafted and captivating series full of big dramatic character arcs and emotional storytelling, and it is to a certain extent. Yep, every coin has two sides, and despite the fact this show has an awful lot going for it, it's unfortunately held back from reaching its true potential by a few glaring issues. Going back to the tone, the series does have problems when it comes to maintaining a consistent one throughout the episode, as occasionally it does start falling into tired sitcom convention territory. Several episodes of this show seem to think doing an incredibly straightforward storyline that's been done a hundred times before will work as long as they force in higher stakes, but it just ends up splitting the episode in two, with one part being honestly quite dull and predictable, and the other being up to the show's usual quality. Take the episode Tarzan and the Rift for example. The main storyline of the episode is Tantor gets a new girlfriend who emotionally manipulates him into severing ties with Turk. Now if that's all the episode was, it'd just be forgettable, but that's only half of it, as the other half focuses on Tarzan trying to track down and then having to hide from a group of poachers, which are really suspenseful and well done scenes. They just don't belong in this episode. So you have this really interesting and enjoyable story spliced in between segments of pointless relationship drama that make the whole thing feel jarring. As one moment we're watching Tantor embarrass himself on a date, then we suddenly cut to Tarzan running from the poachers as they shoot at him. Even when the storylines come together in the end, it doesn't really fit since Tantor's plot suddenly comes to a very abrupt end so they can deal with the poachers. Next up is an issue that is unfortunately prevalent in most most of the episodes. They're not really paced well. While a few minutes ago I praised the series for how ambitious it was with its storytelling, that's a double-sided sword, as quite a few times the show is a little too ambitious. It tries to pack in so much stuff into 20 minutes that oftentimes these elements aren't able to be explored fully, which can also have a negative effect on the characters, as sometimes those interesting conflicts end up getting lost in the mix with everything else so they don't get the chance to reach their potential. And it shocks me that this series only had a single two-part episode as some of these stories desperately needed the extra runtime. A prime example of this is Tarzan and the Leopard Man Rebellion, a sequel episode to Tarzan and the Lost City of Opar that tries to fit in an hour's worth of plot into 20 minutes. The family are watching the professor do a magic show as he tells Tarzan not to be deceived by appearances. Then out of nowhere, the Leopard Men attack taking off with Jane and knocking everyone out. The next morning, everyone starts travelling to Opar, only to discover a powerless La running for her life. Despite his reluctance, Tarzan rescues her. As she explains, the Leopard Men started an uprising and stole her staff, which I mean, can you blame them? They begrudgingly agree to work together. Tarzan gets Jane back and La gets her powers. Meanwhile, Jane is brought before the Leopard Men and given La's staff, which wastes no time in possessing her. Tarzan and La sneak into Opar through the catacombs 
comes beneath the city. Tarzan fights off the Leopard Men while La takes her staff from Jane, leaving her unconscious. Tarzan carries Jane out of Opar while La carries out punishments on her subjects. And that's the midway point of the episode. So much has happened, yet at the same time, it feels like nothing has. No real character arcs have been established, and we've only received minor hints as to what's coming up. So the second half of the episode opens with Jane waking up surrounded by everyone, as she reveals it was the Leopard Men who needed rescuing, not her. La apparently turned them into that, and all they want to do is to be turned back into people, which is why they took Jane so that they could make her their queen and she could in turn free them. Wow, we've finally been told what the episode's about with only 8 minutes left. So Tantor distracts La by seeing he's come bearing gifts, while Tarzan and Jane sneak in and tell the Leopard Men they're here to help. By this point, La's figured out what's going on and continues with her execution of the Leopard Man responsible for this insurrection. As the writers decide, furries aren't enough so they throw in some tentacles for good measure. Tarzan jumps in and frees him as they fight off the tentacles. What follows is a thrilling scene of Tarzan saving Leopard Man and Leopard Man saving Tarzan. But just as they're about to make it out, disaster strikes. What's that, like the 10th time the show's tried to pull this crap with one of the main characters? Jane rushes La, only to be quickly outmatched as she learns of Tarzan's supposed fate. But surprise, Tarzan's not dead. This catches La off guard enough for Tarzan to grab her staff and pass it to Jane. Jane breaks it, which revives all the dead leopard men before killing La via sandification. With La defeated, all the leopard men turn back into regular leopards as everyone has to escape as Opar crumbles behind them. As the family looks on the destroyed city, they can't help but question if this means they are rid of La for good, as we then see the staff fix itself while La's maniacal laugh is heard in the background, setting up the third and final part of this story. It's difficult for me to be so critical over this episode because, at the end of the day, I do really enjoy it. All the characters get a moment to shine, the visuals are consistently high quality, even the colours impressed me in this one but there is still so much missed potential here. The other two La episodes put a really heavy focus on testing the relationship between Tarzan and Jane and giving the characters really interesting challenges. Yet here, we get none of that. As with the episode constantly racing to the next plot point, there is no time for any in-depth character study, which is an issue that affects almost every episode. Nothing else quite to this extent, but you can easily tell how rushed a lot of the episodes feel. Then we have the songs, or lack thereof, because for no reason two episodes of this series feature original musical numbers. Yep, only two, which makes you question why even bother doing them at all. The episodes in question are Tarzan and the Fugitives, which I've already talked about, and Tarzan and the Protégé, which is about Dr. Doyle returning to Africa, this time with her shy and insecure nephew Ian. Through spending the day with Tarzan, Ian slowly starts to admire him and wants to emulate him. Both these songs are internal monologues, sort of trying to replicate how the songs in the original were presented. The best thing I can say about them is they are incredibly short, and not too painful to get through. They aren't catchy, the lyrics sound like they're being made up on the spot, and these actors, bless them for trying, but please stop. Why are these here? They add nothing, and the fact that there's only two of them means whenever they do show up, it immediately catches you off guard. It actually made me miss the Phil Collins soundtrack. Note, the songs in Tarzan are really good on their own, but lack any true connection to the emotions in the context of the narrative beyond very surface level stuff. They don't give you any new information or insight about the characters, and instead usually opt to describe exactly what's happening on screen. Don't worry, we're almost done with the negatives. I've just got one final thing to complain about, and unfortunately it's a big one. Because for all its fantastic elements, the fatal flaw with The Legend of Tarzan is that it doesn't know what it wants to be. Up to this point, I've exclusively talked about The Legend of Tarzan as a spin-off from the Disney animated movie, but that's actually only half of the show's identity, as on top of being a continuation of the film, it's also an adaptation of the series of novels that inspired said film. On paper, that sounds like a really good idea, but it doesn't factor in that Disney's Tarzan is nowhere near the same as the novel series, which means throughout the show, these two ideas are constantly fighting for dominance, which is why you end up with some stories is focused on Tarzan struggling to rise to the challenge of leaving the gorillas, and also stories about leopard people, mystical apes, and dinosaurs, which we'll get to. On their own, these elements are 
fine. I mean, I did say I really do enjoy the Lost City of Opa story arc. If the show wanted to go all in on this insanity, I may not have liked it as much, but I would have greatly respected them for committing to it. But they don't. Instead, they try to introduce all this surreal stuff that simply doesn't fit within the world the movie established, leading to the series having a major identity crisis. While I greatly appreciate the writers trying to incorporate elements from the novels, I do think they should have been a bit more considerate about what might feel out of place. Like, the Waziri people are a great inclusion that expands on the world and feel like they could coexist in the same reality as the movie. Dinosaurs, on the other hand, Okay, let's talk about it. Episode 11, Tarzan and the Hidden World, is the moment where this show completely derails itself. The episode introduces the professor's rival, Samuel T. Philander, who often stole his work. He's able to track him down, thinking Archimedes might have made some big scientific discovery that he can pass off as his own. <laughs> What's he supposed to be, the missing link? Sir, that is my son-in-law! Oh, congratulations, Jane. He's exactly the kind of man I expected you to marry. <laughs> Don't worry, he's not in many episodes. The Professor, under the impression Philander is there investigating a big scientific discoverer, scrambles to figure out what it is so he can beat him to it. During this, Tarzan reveals he's actually seen a real live dinosaur in a place the gorillas call Pellucidor. After some in-law guilt tripping, Tarzan agrees to take them there. Philander follows them and when he is discovered, Jane gives him a good telling off, but forgets about the whole prehistoric killing machines thing. Jane Jane is able to ward them off with some quick thinking and save them all as her and Tarzan want to leave, but the professor isn't so eager. But he's got pictures, Janie, and I haven't got a bit of proof for myself. We must stay until I find something to take back. They stumble across a nest as Archimedes has a moment of weakness and attempts to steal an egg. And there's no way they do an episode about dinosaurs without a T-Rex attack. Tarzan fights it off as everyone makes a run for the exit until the truth comes out. Tarzan gets trapped under a log, forcing the professor to give up his proof to save his family. But, you know, T-Rex. Philander leaves them there to die, but they're able to use science to ride a geyser back up to the not-so-hidden world. Back in London, Philander is made a laughingstock when he learns all the film in his camera was taken by a curious baboon. I will state once more for the record, if I'm taking this as its own thing, I do like it. It's incredibly creative, unapologetically weird, and at its core has a great story about the professor. But it doesn't work when it's placed in between episodes that keep things relatively simple and act like a sequel to the movie. And part of me gets the idea the writers know this, because they try and keep both parts of the show as separate as possible. Carla and the gorillas never appear in any of these more outlandish episodes, nor do any of the concepts get referenced in the more grounded stories. Essentially essentially giving people the option to ignore them. Didn't I say this was one of my favourite shows Disney ever made? Well, it is, but you're always going to be more critical over the things you love. Well, you won't, but I kind of have to, as it's my not really but maybe in the future depending on how this goes job. But I am finally done with the nitpicking, meaning we can leave all that negative stuff behind and just focused on the great things from now on, starting with how badly Disney treated this show. Now, this goes a little beyond simply airing the episodes out of order, to a point where I consider what they did with this series to be one of the most asinine decisions Disney executives have ever made when it comes to releasing a show. I know that's quite a big claim to make considering recent years, but hear me out. First, let's quickly discuss the obvious. They aired the first episode of a very continuity-heavy show as the series finale. Tarzan and Tublat's Revenge is the pilot episode of the series that introduces the closest thing we ever get to a main reoccurring villain with Tublat, a violent gorilla who was once a member of the family until he was exiled by Kerchak. On top of that, the episode also fully introduces Tarzan's fear of not being able to measure up to Kerchak and is all around a perfect first episode of the series. Series. So it was aired as episode 36 instead for no reason whatsoever. Meaning we saw all the sequel episodes to this story first, and that's not the only time it happened, and not even the worst time. Okay, 
Let's talk about Tarzan and Jane, the direct-to-DVD movie based on the series. I'm not going to talk about the plot or the movie itself because I genuinely don't think it's worthy of discussion as it's such a nothing movie. The only thing of note is how weird it is that it exists at all. In the 90s and early 2000s, Disney was creating spin-off shows based on their movies left and right, so naturally a few of those would inevitably not work out. But rather than scrapping the work already done on them, Disney took the three episodes that had already been made, stitched them together with some cheap wraparound segments and passed it off as a sequel. They did this with Beauty and the Beast, Cinderella and Atlantis. However, two of them are in a completely different category. Those being Hercules Zero to Hero and Tarzan and Jane. You see, while the other pseudo sequel package movies were made up of completed episodes from scrapped TV shows, both of these movies were based on shows that actually did come out. But what sets Tarzan and Jane apart is they took three episodes that was supposed to air as part of the series and put them in the movie instead. A movie that released in 2002, a year after the show ended. One of these episodes is called Tarzan and the British Invasion, which introduces Jane's trio of friends from England who have come to rescue her, Eleanor, Greenlee and Hazel. Characters who also star in episode 25 of the series, Tarzan and the New Wave, which again, was released a year before the episode that was actually supposed to introduce these characters. And the same also applies to the second episode of the movie. Now, those episodes from Tarzan and Jane did eventually air by themselves on TV another year later, where they were branded as season two. I'm trying to wrap my head around why they thought this was a good idea. If they wanna make a mediocre direct-to-DVD movie that gave anyone who saw it first a bad impression of the show, Fine, but why would you specifically remove episodes that have sequels? There are so many episodes in this show they could have made exclusive for the movie without causing any problems. Maybe the ones that aren't the weakest of the entire show. Instead, all it did was confuse a bunch of kids who had no clue who these people were or how Tarzan knew them. But the biggest travesty here is in doing this, they prevented a bunch of people from witnessing the greatest moment of the entire franchise. Tarzan, do tell us more about your family. I... Uh, I never knew them. Oh, oh that's very sad. sad. They were killed by Sabor, the leopard. Oh. In this room. Oh. Right there. Okay, for real now, that is everything negative I have to say about this series and anything surrounding it. So to bring the mood back up before we end off, I'm going to talk about five notable episodes of the series. These aren't my personal favourites, well, aside from one, but they're all either really interesting or incredibly bizarre to the point where I think they warrant further discussion. Episode 14, Tarzan and the Jungle Madness sees Tarzan and Jane return from a visit to the Waziri village. As Hugo and Huft inform them of their new business venture, Dog Whistles. As Jane is informing them of the flaw in their plan, the boat docks by the trading post, which is expanding with new guest rooms, running water and radio towers. As the two swing home, they notice how eerily quiet the jungle seems, only to find the treehouse and camp ransacked and the professor missing. Eventually, Turk and Tantor show up rambling about some insufferable ringing, until they lash out attacking Tarzan and Jane. What follows is a tense story about Tarzan and Jane running from every creature in the jungle while also trying to figure out what caused this. Eventually, they find some mysterious new flower they believe to be the culprit, but this discovery is short-lived thanks to tragedy. Daddy. Fortunately, the professor had been able to make an antidote. However, once Tarzan and Jane find it, they discover it has no effect. Tarzan and Jane get chased into a cave where they come across the very much alive professor. By this point, Tarzan has figured out the ringing is being caused by DeMont's new radio towers. As like the dog whistles, it was creating noise at a frequency only the animals could hear. And so he tricks the animals into knocking them down, thus bringing them back to their senses. The mystery of this episode is so well done, despite the fact that the answer is given to you right at the beginning. Though for kids, I imagine it would be effective in fooling them, especially with the flowers acting as a red herring. It's also another episode to demonstrate why people shouldn't underestimate Tarzan's intelligence. But what's really remarkable about this one is how it establishes a certain tone for the whole thing. Seeing Turk and Tantor lashing out at Tarzan and Jane can actually be genuinely unsettling to watch. The whole thing just builds into this beautiful crescendo that gets my heart racing 
every time I revisit it. Episode 17, Tarzan and the Rough Rider, is one of the most strangely fascinating episodes of any show I have ever seen. This is an episode in which Tarzan saves the former 26th President of the United States of America, Theodore Teddy Roosevelt, from a kidnapping plot. I'll give you a second to process that, okay? Here we go. The former 26th President of the United States, Teddy Roosevelt, arrives in Africa for a safari, and upon meeting Tarzan, chooses him to be his guide over the people already assigned to him. Good thing too, since they are actually part of a group of thugs plotting to kidnap the 26th President of the United States, Teddy Roosevelt. However, we quickly learn former 26th President of the United States, Teddy Roosevelt, isn't here to merely observe. As the first chance he gets, he attempts to shoot Tantor. I thought you were a great leader like Kurtz. But you bring guns for hunting like... Like Clayton. I love how even in an episode about Tarzan meeting the former 26th President of the United States, Teddy Roosevelt, they are still trying to find a way to tie it back into the movie. You gotta admire that level of hustle. While Tarzan's back is turned, the former 26th President of the United States, Teddy Roosevelt, is taken by the thugs. Tarzan attempts to save him, only to end up captured as well. While they're tied up, the former 26th President of the United States, Teddy Roosevelt, apologises. As Tarzan asks him why humans hunt for Sport. Not for sport, for science. How else could we study a two-ton elephant? Not everyone has all this wide, unspoiled space in which to get acquainted with the animals. Why not? Well, that's a very, very good question. <laughs> they manage to escape, but former 26th President of the United States, Teddy Roosevelt, has twisted his leg. So they have to take a rest. In this moment of respite, the former 26th President of the United States, Teddy Roosevelt, asks Tarzan to teach him how to talk to the animals. They're cornered by the thugs as Tarzan is netted, but Turk and Tantor charge in with a stampede. Tarzan climbs up to the blimp while Tantor anchors it. Turk climbs up to offer some assistance, then the villain pulls a grenade. Thankfully though, everyone escapes in a plane. At the docks, former 26th President of the United States, Teddy Roosevelt, once more apologises for his earlier actions, and vows to head home and share what he's learned with his people. Jane was right. You are a great leader, like Kerchak. Maybe. I'm gonna try to be a great leader, like Tarzan. Then former 26th President of the United States, Teddy Roosevelt, heads off and the episode ends. How on earth did an episode like this ever come into existence? Someone at Disney had to pitch this idea, others had to sign off on it, and many more people had to work on it, and at no point did anyone stop for a second and think, hey, this is kind of dumb. But the most baffling thing about all this is that it kind of works. It's got a good message, it's one of the better paced episodes of the series, and as incomprehensible as the idea of Tarzan becoming friends with the former 26th President of the United States, Teddy Roosevelt is, there is a lot of really great back and forth between them, to the point where you do kind of buy into it. If you want to watch something with a completely nonsensical plot that manages to take itself seriously and somehow pull it off, I can't think of anything better to recommend than Tarzan and the Rough Rider. Moving right along, to episode 20, Tarzan and the Challenger, a much more straightforward episode that doesn't make me question all of reality. The gorillas are being terrorised by a giant python named Hista, while Tarzan is having a date night with Jane. They do manage to catch wind of this as Tarzan shows up to save everyone at the last second. Later on, as everyone is recovering, Tarzan's leadership is called into question, as the other gorillas see Jane as a conflict of interest leading to a younger, more brash gorilla named Moyo challenging Tarzan for the role of head of the family. That night, Carla comforts Tarzan, who is grappling with a question Moyo posed earlier, over what he would do if he had to choose between Jane and the gorillas. There's no choice to make, Tarzan. Jane is part of the family. I wish that were true. That morning, we learn how this whole challenge thing works. Both opponents climb up into a tree and fight, with the first person to hit the ground being the loser. Moyo, in his attempts to defeat Tarzan, ends up creating a pit of spikes down below, leading Tarzan to save him only for the vine to snap, causing him to hit the ground, thus losing the challenge. And what's Moyo's first decision as the new leader? To order the family to travel around the outskirts of the jungle for a few weeks until Hister is gone. Tarzan decides to stay up all night, reading upon Python, to find a way to defeat Hista. Then, in a matter of minutes, is able to track down the gorillas who have been walking for an entire day. 
I'm just not going to question that. Following yet another tender moment between Tarzan and Jane, it's revealed Moyo has led the gorillas right onto Hista's doorstep and into a tar pit. One of the baby gorillas gets away and is able to run all the way to Tarzan. He arrives and starts to fight off Hista, but since the scene already didn't have enough tension, the entire family starts sinking out of nowhere. Hista temporarily takes Tarzan out of commission, which is when Jane steps up to the plate, leading Hista away so Tarzan can save the gorillas. Soon as he's out, Moyo rushes off to go help Jane, realising he was wrong about her while Tarzan saves everyone else. Moyo gets Jane out of danger as Tarzan uses the knowledge he picked up from his late night study session to cloak themselves. Him and Moyo work together to defeat Hista, by luring them into the tar pit where it almost instantly drowns. And we end with Moyo apologising to Tarzan and Jane, admitting he's not ready to be a leader yet and transferring power back over to Tarzan. This is the perfect episode of the series. But when I say that, I don't mean it's the best. If I were to rank these, it would probably end up around the top 10. What I mean is this is an episode that best utilises all the series' most engaging elements while also not falling victim to any of the major problems I have with the show. Its storytelling is very much in line with the film. It presents Tarzan with a really interesting conflict that tests the strength of his character. The pacing, for once, is really good, with the episode having a lot of action, yet still giving plenty of time for quiet moments where the characters can just process their emotions. It takes a simple concept and does everything it possibly can with it, while still leaving room for lots of great character development, which is something I wish more of the episodes had been able to accomplish. Next, we're going to do something a little bit different and skip to the end to talk about the finale, because yeah, despite the series having such a short lifespan and being treated horribly by the network, it's still got to have some kind of ending, in the form of a clip show that doesn't have Tarzan show up until the last five minutes. However, while that does sound like an incredibly lacklustre finale in the making, they do somehow manage to have it be quite engaging. Episode 35 is called Tarzan and the Mysterious Visitor. We open in America at a publishing company where we meet Ed, an established author who is struggling to find inspiration for his next book. A paper flies into Ed's face which has an article on Tarzan, which is credited to Philander. The dollar store Nigel Thornberry you should remember from Tarzan and the Hidden World. Feeling he might have found his inspiration, Ed travels to London and seeks out Philander, who's seen better days. Basically, throughout the series, we see his fall from a distinguished member of the scientific community with a job as a university professor, to a laughing stock living in destitution who owes money to every mobster in London. I would feel bad for him, but he is guilty of at least four attempted murders. Philander regales Ed with the tale of how he first met Tarzan, meaning it's time for some flashbacks to Tarzan and the Hidden World. Yay! Ed finds it a little hard to believe, causing Philander to throw him out. And that marks the final appearance of Samuel T. Philander, who was most likely paddled to death shortly thereafter. Ed travels back home and goes to a diner where a friend encourages him to dig a little deeper. So Ed travels to Africa and arrives at Dumont's trading post. And the first two people he talks to are Hugo and Hawk. Stars and bars, we love them. Where are you from, Tiny? Chicago. Ch -ch -ch Chicago? Say, you don't happen to work for a guy who goes by the name of Joey the Shark, do you? Uh, no, never heard of him. <gasps> and completely out of nowhere, the duo recount their time running from the French Legion. So next up on our tour down memory lane is Tarzan and the Fugitives. Or just the first five minutes, as Ed quickly grows bored of their embellishment of the events. And that's the final appearance of Hugo and Hook. Yeah, now let's talk about royalties for a second here, shall we? I figure we can get 50 and a half cents on the dollar. Yeah, each. Oh, good thinking, Junior. Ed goes to buy his ticket home, only for Dumont to say he can tell the writer all about Tarzan. Sir, everything here is for sale, and nothing isn't. Yeah, a payoff, huh? Uh, my memory is still a bit foggy. Mm-hmm. What is it with everyone being so hard up for cash? flashbacks to Tarzan and the Trading Post. Dumont finishes the story by saying the best way to learn about Tarzan is by talking to the man himself, which excites Ed until Dumont, in his final act before he departs the series, gives him some vague directions. Ed sets off by himself to find Tarzan and is attacked by a panther, which always leads to one thing.
Tarzan brings Ed to the treehouse and gives him the full lowdown. Jane butts in, saying Ed shouldn't be so fixated on the action and spectacle as there's so much more to Tarzan outside of that. Giving us a quick recap of Jane's arc throughout the series and her marriage to Tarzan through a montage. Ed finally gets a sense of the full picture and realises he has his inspiration. Ed, this is the one they'll remember you for. You really think so? Absolutely, Ed. Oh, it's pure gold. While it's admittedly a letdown, having the finale of a series like this end up as a clip show, most likely due to budget constraints, once again we see the show make the best potential product from a bad situation. Even though it's not the epic grand adventure you'd want to wrap up a show like this, Tarzan and the Mysterious Visitor does manage to somewhat reflect on the series, giving a few of the show's reoccurring side characters one final hurrah after their arcs have already wrapped up. Of course, the most noteworthy thing about this is that it stars as a fictionalised version of Edgar Rice Burroughs, the author of the Tarzan series of novels, thus allowing the entire franchise to come full circle. And since the episode is built around Ed learning about Tarzan, the episode can sort of act as a character study on the ape man, with Jane's final speech making a definitive statement on who Tarzan is. Even though it's not the finale I'd want from this series, it's a wholesome and sweet episode that does manage to provide a small bit of closure. And the final episode I'll be looking at in this video is what I considered for the longest time to be my favourite of the series. However, after re-watching them all for this video, I have gained such an appreciation for so many other episodes that I don't think I can say that with full confidence anymore. But still, I consider it to be a phenomenal episode with some of the highest highs of the series. So without further ado, let's take a look at Tarzan and the Gauntlet of Vengeance. It opens in an English tavern down by the docks. A cloaked woman is there who wants to learn more about the mythical ape man and how to find him. He's not a bloke you want to underestimate. My friend, it is Tarzan who should not underestimate me. In the camp, the professor is chasing a mosquito, as Jane likens the situation to Moby Dick, which Tarzan is confused by. So Jane enlightens him. You see, Captain Ahab loses his leg to the white whale and becomes so intent on revenge that his hatred becomes an obsession. Obsessed with hatred? Ding ding ding! That's our main theme of the episode, folks! See if you can guess how the story of Moby Dick may tie into our new villainess. Tarzan, Jane and the Professor head to the trading post, where Dumont is tending to our new friends. She requests a guide for her non-hunting expedition, specifically asking for Tarzan. As Dumont is showing them around, Tarzan arrives just in time to save everyone from some rogue barrels. We learn the woman's name is Lady Walton, as Tarzan starts to show her the jungle and all its majesty. Africa. I can see why my brother loved it so. Is something wrong? No, nothing. Nothing at all. In fact, this is all going exactly as I'd hoped. Have you figured it out yet? Meanwhile, the valet, who we later learn is called Hobson, abducts the rest of the main cast. Tarzan and Lady Walton take part in the show's favourite pastime, out of nowhere conversations about ideologies. In today's instance, the subject is revenge. Animals don't understand revenge. Only humans do. <laughs> of course. And we are humans, aren't we? Have you figured it out yet? They return to the treehouse and find Jane missing as Lady Walton reveals her true colours. And I hope you figured it out by now because time's up! Think back. Jane and the Professor didn't come to Africa alone, did they? Clayton. Then we're thrown into a flashback of Clayton's death, which, sure, they don't show the hanging corpse or anything, but everything else is exactly the same, and it's kind of shocking because it's way further than this show has ever gone before. Lady Walton is, or I should say was, Clayton's sister, who in her months of wallowing in grief only thought about exacting her revenge. Right now, Jane, Turk, Tantor and the Professor are in various death traps across the jungle, and if Tarzan hurries, he might be able to save most of them. And just to put the cherry on top, Tarzan is stricken with a poison dart, and the antidote is far away on a mountain she's dubbed Clayton's Peak, leaving Tarzan the choice of either saving himself or his family, and time is of the essence. Tarzan rescues Turk and Tantor first, both times quickly rushing off to find the next family member, all while Lady Walton and Hobson watch on as the poison slowly takes over his body. He is a remarkable man. Man? He isn't a man. He's a monster! A savage, deadly monster! 
Yes, ma'am. A monster. Lady Waltham is played by Amanda Donahue, who delivers a great performance throughout the episode, especially in the moments when her rage takes over and you can just hear the raw emotion in the actress. As the professor awaits his fate, we actually get something resembling character insight, even if it's just for a brief moment. No Tarzan to save me now! Besides, I'm probably just an annoyance, the meddling father-in-law. Tarzan fights against the poison to rescue the professor, and then using his last bit of strength, starts running. He sets the professor down and rushes off to find Jane, who is trapped in a cage at high tide. Clayton's peak and the antidote. All you have to do is go and get it. Oh, but then Jane would die. Oh dear, tough choice. No choice at all. Tarzan dives in and barely manages to rescue Jane but then quickly collapses. He gets up and despite almost being out of time heads towards Clayton's peak and is actually about to make it, except for one catch. Too bad it's all for naught Tarzan, what with the antidote being right here in my hand. Lady Waltham is attacked only to be saved by Tarzan, forcing her to realise he's not the monster she thought he was and so she gives him the antidote. At the treehouse, Tarzan comes to as the professor announces he will make a full recovery. But there's one final surprise. You would have sacrificed yourself to save me. I now know you couldn't have killed Clayton, and if I hadn't been so wrapped up in my own hatred, I would have seen that. There, there are no words to express how sorry I am. Those words will do just fine. While it isn't immune to the pacing issues that hang over the rest of the show, especially during the ending, Tarzan and the Gauntlet of Vengeance is just as thrilling now as when I first saw it years ago. It takes the Disney sequel cliche of the villain's relative attempting to avenge them and turns it into something emotional, action-packed and smartly written. What really makes this one stand out is that the villain is the protagonist. While we follow Tarzan on his race to save his loved ones before succumbing to the poison, it's Lady Walton who gets a full character arc, as throughout the episode we see her slowly start to question her preconceptions of Tarzan until eventually realising she was wrong. It's a well constructed example of how grief can mentally destroy a person and cause them to act irrationally. I imagine a lot of people will take issue with how quickly Tarzan forgives her, especially after she just tried to kill him and his family. But that's kind of the territory that comes with a show that's so constantly intent on raising the stakes as high as possible. And that concludes my review and analysis of The Legend of Tarzan. Okay, let's try and wrap this up quick because I've been sitting here for the past few hours and I cannot feel my legs anymore. The Legend of Tarzan, in spite of its many, many faults, will always be an extremely special and personal show to me. I saw quite a few reruns of the series as I was growing up, but only when I revisited it in my teen years did I really grow to appreciate how groundbreaking it was for the time. Despite the odds being stacked against it and the visuals being a mixed bag, it was the first Disney spin-off that I felt really tried to be a natural continuation of the film. Going to great lengths to develop its characters and tackle more complex subject matter that you really didn't see in a lot of kids entertainment around this time, especially not with the level of maturity and tact that this series had. Most people's experience with this series starts and ends with Tarzan and Jane, which is not at all a good representation of the quality often found in this series, and it's sad to think people watch that movie and don't want to look a little further, so they never get to see fantastic episodes like Gauntlet of Vengeance or The Outbreak. This series was essentially trying to do what Tangled and Big Hero 6 did 16 years later, and I felt in the end, it mostly succeeded. Even though you can tell this really was rushed, you have to respect that the people behind this show really gave it their all and should be commended for turning out something this ambitious and different. They could have done a simple comedy show about Tantor and Turk and called it a day, but they went the extra mile, working with their limitations to turn out an end product that that, while not always consistent, almost never stops being a thoroughly enjoyable and engaging show. And if you also want to check out this bizarre yet passion-filled cash grab, too bad, you can't. Because it's not available to watch legally anywhere. It's not on Disney Plus in any territory to my knowledge, and there was never any substantial home release. So if you're interested in watching this show, 
I guess you're just plain out of luck. I mean, I would never suggest searching for the show on a free streaming site or even right here on YouTube where you'd find most of the episodes in pretty high quality, because that'd be morally wrong. Just because Disney, as often is the case, refuses to acknowledge these shows' existence or put them anywhere people will be able to watch them legally, that doesn't make it right. So I guess you'll just have to do without and go watch one of the many other high quality titles that actually are on Disney+, Plus, like Marvel Superhero Squad Show, or Kirby Buckets, or Fastlane. Only the most premium content. If you're new around here, feel free to subscribe and comment down below as it helps me out a whole lot. Thanks so much for watching folks and I'll see ya real soon.